This episode of The Clear Out was recorded on the 31st of August 2022 at home in Wicklow. And it's a discussion uh, about the battle between anxiety and calmness. And I argue that we are living in an age of anxiety and talk a bit about how the nature of how we consume the world has changed uh, with the with the digital age so there's a correlation there between the advent of ever increasing and ever more accessible technology and information platforms and the increase in our anxiety uh, I talk about how some of us may be naturally calmer and naturally more anxious than others and I look at how to perhaps redress the balance there so that's um that's broadly what today's episode is about uh, i also have a little bit of time at the end of the episode just to reflect on the passing of mikhail gorbachev the former soviet leader and his role in the end of the the soviet union and what is his legacy is and there's a, a movie recommendation to go along with that. So um, so that's it. Yeah, that's what's coming up. Um, and I'll need some help. Uh, too late now because it's already done. But uh, I regret not having more vocabulary to, to, to choose from when using the, the main metaphor for this week, which is clocks and watches and the mechanical parts therein. So, um, yeah, listen uh, to find out more. Okay, I'll see you around the corner. Cheers. Ooh, not gonna change my mind. Leaving the dream behind. Hi, my name is Dara Clear, and you're listening to The Clear Out. How are you today? How's your, how's your timer? How's your, your little, your little setting? Your cogs, your cogs and wheels and pulleys, <laughs> the machine, the machine, is it running smoothly? Is it sputtering and spluttering? Is it backfiring? Well, I tell you what, it's the first day of school. My daughter went back to school this morning and... It feels like the house is quiet for the first time in two months. <laughs> Off she went, not a bother on her. Photographs taken for the records. She's reluctant, a reluctant subject. Unlike her father, always happy to pose for a shot. <laughs> Although she has of late had the habit of surreptitiously getting a hold of my phone or my wife's phone and taking little on the sly selfies or I'll pick up my phone and realize there's 57 shots of one of her cuddlies one of her soft toys and these strange selfies with her looking down at the screen from above anyway best of luck to her it'll be a while now you are you mark my words mark this date it'll be a while before she gets her hands on her own mobile phone she uh she's not yet nine she'll be turning nine in october so anyway best of luck to her first day of third class sort of moving into the the senior ranks um yeah it's amazing it's a <laughs> it's amazing how quickly it goes oh i remember holding her in my arms shedding tears of joy and relief over her little head it's amazing how quickly it goes I try, I, I I try to um, to not to not be complacent or blasé about this time I have with her. Um, I try to to remember uh, or to, to 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 remind myself that the time. Well, I mean, realistically, the time when she's still willing to listen to me to spend time with me, wants to spend time with me, wants to do stuff with me. There's 
there's less of that time left um because really she's closer to closer to the time when i will not be of interest to her uh perhaps my my wife won't be of interest to her either seeing as it's just a few years really to the teen years and um the real pure <laughs> childhood stuff is coming to an end now i'm not being i'm not being fatalistic or morbid or um i'm not trying to put any sort of a, a negative spin i'm just trying to look at it and go you don't want to look back at this time and go i didn't appreciate her while she was just this abundant this ball of abundant energy and positivity and re a reasonable amount of openness to uh to the exchange to the interaction um definitely I, that's something that's that struck me um i remember i remember watching a documentary maybe maybe i've mentioned this before i remember watching a documentary on australian tv when we were living out there and it was it was a very you know it was a really grim um a grim documentary focusing as it did on um i think of particular focus was this young irish woman who'd been abducted and killed in melbourne and i can't remember if it was a general um a, a general look at homicide detectives in the australian police force or, or if it was specifically that case but i remember a, a very experienced homicide detective almost breaking down while being interviewed at one point and it had nothing to do with the ghastly grisly things he'd seen throughout his career he was crying because he hadn't spent more time with his children and um that really struck me and it wasn't i mean i feel like my wiring and my disposition is already leaning towards i want to spend as much time as possible with my daughter and have have always done really so i'm lucky in that regard and i've been lucky with the type of work i've chosen um and the type of work i i haven't chosen <laughs> that i've had plenty of time i don't feel like i've i don't feel like i've missed out um and that's that's great it's um it's not an area you know when, when i think about areas of my parenting experience where i have regrets or concerns it's not that area um usually as i've as i've shared before usually it's in the area of sometimes being unduly cross or stern or angry or or shouty uh with my daughter when yeah it just it just hasn't been warranted and it's more a reflection of my own crap rather than anything she's doing occasionally occasionally it is stuff she's doing <laughs> but uh in any case there you go it's another it's another moment to mark and um yeah thinking of thinking of her off to school for another another big year and yeah just thinking of those memories of of, of school myself um this time of year in ireland this time of year in europe september end of august september going back to school funny funny time that's a that sort of autumn indian summer weather usually always remember generally very good weather in september lots of sunshine cold mornings cold nights but um yeah hot days um relatively speaking this doesn't compare to uh the tropics or anything like that but um but it has it has been a good summer it has been a good summer anyway there you go so yes here we are again it's another another week has gone and it's time for another reflection another discussion another tour around the suburbs of wellness to see what we can land on today and there's a couple of things that have come up now that i've been thinking about and um yeah it's uh i mentioned at the start i asked you how your how your timer was and the cogs 
little cogs and spinning things inside the machine of you. Now, of course, you can get all anatomical on me and start talking about different internal organs and what way your stomach is and what way your lungs are and what way your heart is and your liver. Oh, God, the poor old liver. The liver takes takes a, takes a baiting. It takes a baiting, lads all that drink um you can talk to me about that stuff but i'm not i'm never really thinking about that unless that's something that is of uh, actual present concern as ever i'm thinking metaphorically i'm thinking in terms of what fires my imagination and how i think about being existence how we are in our in our imagined selves, in our visualized selves. Um, But I've been thinking about this idea of anxiety versus calmness. And I don't know what's been at me this week, but I've had a a few days of anxiety. Um, That very unsettling feeling, this sort of commotion uh, under the surface, behind the scenes, this this distraction internally that just won't let me settle. And I've been, you know, I've been working. I've been, I've been working all 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 summer long. And busy with that, and so as ever, work can be a great distraction to immerse yourself in something and get on with that and. You're not left with time to to sit and ruminate. Uh, Work can also be a a very negative distraction from other things that feel far more important and far more pressing. Work has a a horrible way of getting in the way of life. And um, yeah, that's why when when we find work, I think we should always be, always be asking ourselves, is this where... I am best being put to use. Am I making the best of myself? What purpose is this serving? Um, or am I just a cog in that machine? Uh, and sometimes that can be that can be an answer. Um, but in any case, this idea of anxiety versus calmness. Um, and where we, where we naturally run, where we naturally operate. And when I say that, what I mean is what's our, what's our default setting, our default inner tempo. And that's what I mean by a setting. Um, and I think I think by virtue of quite a few different things, by virtue of parenting, you know, what what you received, what energy, what vibe, what temperament, uh, what atmosphere you were handed as a child, what you grew up with um, in your home from the, the nurturing point of view, from the environmental point of view, that's obviously a massive factor in your inner tempo your your natural your natural internal pace barometer metronome um and also of course it can be something inherited you might um inherit something from either parent or both parents in terms of that tempo um so and then maybe you you have something that's all your own that's all your own so some of us may just have a calmer slower more moderate tempo and i didn't bother look up my musical terms before uh, i started recording but um yeah there's something there's some (laughs) tell me there'll be some musical term to decide to uh to denote that very 
gentle, languid, easy, calm expression of one's instrument. Uh, it may be legato. Um, we used to use those terms in, uh, in acting school, legato and staccato. Um, and the idea of legato being fluid, flowing, smooth, calm, connected, as opposed to the choppy, uh, interrupted energy of staccato, choppy, bitey, barky, snappy. Oh, listen to those lovely onomatopoeic, onomatopoeic words. Snap, bite, bark. Um, so anyway, you might be given, you might be, you might be very lucky and you might have a tempo in life that allows you to naturally remain calm in all situations, not prone to the freak out, not prone to the overreaction, um, able to I don't want to say cruise because I'm not trying to I'm not trying to make a an a, an equivalence with things being easy um or no bother or not a problem if the tempo is the slower calmer one um but it certainly buys more time I think it certainly buys more time and more space to to respond in a way that perhaps allows uh, a decision that is that is more optimal for you. The the other tempo, if your setting is basically one that's set at a higher frequency, uh, more I don't know. If, and, and again, we can you can we can make an, an assumption of a finer instrument, finer tuning. Um, I don't want to go to that place. I don't want to jump up there because as I've said, I, I've mentioned this many times um, over the podcast that I do believe we're living in an age of anxiety um, and I don't need to go through all the news headlines and lay out all the different things that are, are happening in the world um, from a, a, a you know climate point of view or economic point of view or health point of view the um i would say the the the, the tempo of the world has has never been more frenetic uh certainly in terms of what we're being presented with um across all media platforms um i think we're given an awful lot of information that is um is extremely provocative is extremely um overstimulating um is aggressively insidious and that that definitely gets inside us and well again maybe 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 for someone who, who that doesn't affect, maybe that just bounces off you. But I don't know. I don't know. Um, this is also, I think, linked to the digital age, which is, that's how I describe really the last 20 years. Um, I think the acceleration of technology the acceleration of the big tech companies the advent of social media platforms um all of this has contributed to um a worldwide change in how we interact with each other and how we consume the world and while there are obvious benefits to that uh, the, the, the sort of accessibility to to people all over the world, um, the accessibility to markets all over the world, the 
the multiculturalism of that, the ability to to change our, our working practices uh, that may give us more freedom, the ability to work for international companies without having to go to another country, um, all of these kinds of things, um, access to access to information, access to learning, access to arts. Um, it's never been easier to access music and movies and books. Um, all of that stuff is is fantastic. Um, and yet, and yet, these new habits these new lifestyle habits, these new consumption habits are, I believe, pushing us away from thoughtfulness. They're pushing us away from reflection. They're pushing us away from consideration. Um, the democratization of of access to to public platforms um you know, that's what i avail of that's what i've availed of availed of with my my blog for eight or nine years and now with the um with the podcast as well i'm doing that um but my reluctance initially to do anything um, in this domain was because um, I didn't want to contribute to, to something um, superficial, insubstantial, trivial, um, sound bitey, performative, um, something that was just... Uh, an opportunity to curate an image, get a hit. I don't know. What I saw was just this deluge of opinion, um, deluge of, I suppose, I mean, look, to step back from which is you, you kind of go, well, okay, it's a new, it's a new mode of communication. These were, these were new modes of communication that were available to everyone. So what you saw was a huge variance in quality while everyone had a shot and played and dabbled. And some people did very well. Some people put up awful stuff. That's still the case. Um, and yeah, I mean, that's again, as, as, as ever, one of my one of my great moments of expressing the absolutely obvious but um the, you know the, the 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 point i was trying to make was all of this stuff has contributed to a dilution of quality a, a dilution of quality uh, a huge increase in quantity but the the quantitative aspect of it um, is that we have been receiving and producing smaller pieces of information in much larger quantities. So digestible pieces of information. And it's what platforms like Twitter have thrived on, obviously, with their the, you know, the limit of how much you can put up on Twitter. Um, and it's what a lot of media platforms have thrived on. There's a way of delivering information and a way of delivering news that ultimately, ultimately has you know has has leaned more and more and more towards uh, sensationalism. It's in a way, it's like everything has become tabloid journalism. In a way, I mean, I know there's 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 a very cold, um, balanced arguments to, to counter that. There's still long form journalism available on many platforms, but ultimately, it feels like it has been and continues to be 
uh, a bit of a race to the bottom and the way uh, the way discourse has gone about so many different matters the and the particularly the fear of offending people um, and the fear of being accused of not being sensitive enough um the the fear of being the fear of being cancelled um has really led to a um a less powerful and less incisive um and less trenchant form of discourse uh particularly around social issues and political issues um and and i suppose if you want to put cultural issues into that as well um we're talking about culture wars and identity politics so we're, we're back into this area of the dubious uh righteousness of woke politics um which i've, I've discussed before at length um but in any case, so all of that stuff has led us to a sort of an acceleration, an acceleration of how we consume the world. And that acceleration, I believe, has become a key component in in a general sense of acceleration in our lives. And that feeds back into what I started talking about, because that feeds back into our setting, our timer, how we feel. Um, because if we're running too fast, and if you want, you can make this a very... We'll make it a very um, a very literal metaphor, if that's not an oxymoron. Running too fast on the road, running too fast down a hill. You know, sometimes I see my daughter set off running and not so much now because she's a little bit older. When she was younger, your fear is, oh, my God, she's going to she's going to fall. She's going to snot herself. She's going to uh, do a face plant trip over and because the fear is you're running too fast and you can't stop your momentum and you're basically going to lose control and end up doing yourself an injury. So in a way, the age of anxiety, I think, has us all internally running too fast. And maybe you're one of the lucky ones who has the 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 slower setting the calmer setting the setting that allows you to enjoy a sense of more control allows you it allows you to enjoy a sense of more time and see that there, there you go like that's the that's really the luxury isn't it the luxury of feeling i have enough time time can give you space because time allows you allows you to read the situation time allows you to read the room time allows you to read the other person to assess the situation and then strategize then respond optimally then adjust yourself to get a better result time allows you to step back to step off the line of attack to use uh to use the um the 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 karate um strategy to which i've referred before so there's a big difference in those two settings um and yes, you can argue, as I've already made the argument, that this could just be your natural state. 
it could just be your natural setting um i can't help but feel when i conceive of these things when i think about these ideas that the the higher faster speedier setting lives higher in the body that it's a very upward um it's a very it's, it's upwardly placed in the body and the the result of that is a feeling of of detachment from the ground a feeling of being disconnected whereas the slower setting the calmer setting if you will sits lower in the body and drops down deeper into the belly and i can even hear as i speak as i visualize this i can hear my voice change <laughs> because that drop down brings connection and just talking about it i can feel the the, the energy shift in my own body and I, I you know when i talk about the down and the lower setting i'm sitting deeper i can feel the weight through my my hips through my waist through my trunk and energy dropping down into the into the diaphragm and that is instantly more satisfying um and this is something i i i often play with in in martial arts when i'm teaching um to illustrate how suggestible the body is to the to to one's internal energy being conducted by outside forces um and it's a, it, it it's 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 very easy to illustrate when that energy drives upwards up towards the chest up towards the neck up into the head that center of of so much uh you know which, which, where, where so much of our stress can be located because of the thoughts we're having um things upsetting us and that busy pointy energy upwards through the head and that energy just fires out of us like like a volcano erupting it's just lava invisible lava exploding out of the top of our head and pouring over us and you think about it now again i'm not a, a geologist or um what, what's <laughs> what, what do you call somebody who studies volcanoes um oh man anyway um a volcanologist no i don't know but think about it if a volcano fundamentally is a mountain with a cavity uh with lava and the eruption of the volcano is the mountain emptying itself so there you've, you've got that idea of like creating the cavity down below and this is what we do when we're when we're running when we're running at speed when we're running with that with that heat um the heat of stress the heat of that acceleration um and what we what i think is more optimal and what i think can be learned and can be trained and can be cultivated is this opposite energy of dropping down into ourselves and feeling that connection and feeling that we're on solid ground uh and that's what you know that's what i try to do myself if i'm feeling anxious as i have been doing i really try to engage the breath and drop down into myself and really focus on the physical and getting back into the body because often anxiety as much as there are physical effects physical side effects to anxiety or physical responses to anxiety anxiety is a product of of the mind um the product of thoughts and emotions so for me the the remedy is a two-tiered approach one is to try and identify in my thinking in my emotions why am i unsettled why am i bothered what's at the root of this now that's not always an obvious answer uh and certainly there are times i think jesus maybe i need to maybe i need to get back into a, a therapeutic setting and uh, have someone else answer these questions for me but i think a lot of modern uh, therapeutic practice is simply the uh the the the, the professional in question psychologist or counselor or whatever all they do is very gently with their lovely calm energy just go hmm 
And what do you think about that? And it, all they're really doing is helping you find out, find the answers yourself. Um, so sometimes, <laughs> sometimes you just want someone to go, oh, listen, just cut the shit and, you know, tell me what you think. Just, you know, prescribe. It's okay. You don't have to be passive and neutral and let me work it out for myself. Sometimes just give me the answer. Uh, that's the that's the impatient impulse. But um, I referred earlier to COGS and I don't know if you remember. I don't know if you, well, you won't remember if you weren't in Ireland or England. There was an ad in the, I guess in the 80s for flora margarine flora margarine now, now margarine was anathema in our household we were uh, strictly a full fat butter <laughs> crew and um, margarine to me was an alien thing um, I knew it were friends of mine who got it and I just thought this stuff is disgusting but anyway the, uh, the great consumer of things on the screen uh, that I was as a child, there was an ad for Flora Margarine that featured the opened up back of a watch. Uh, so an analog watch, not a digital watch. And my memory is that it was a gold watch and they open up the back of the watch and you can see all the cogs, the mechanics of this beautiful piece of, mm, of, of what, of machinery. And you saw the cogs turning and you could hear, you could hear the, the very fine ticking of, of, of the watch. And the the ad the the you know the, the 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 catch line or whatever of the ad was, you know, flora margarine was using such um, such clean light, good for you oil in their margarine. It was so light, and here they held up something like a little pipette, and dropped a drop of oil for the margarine into the the clockworks into the the cogs the workings of the watch and the tick 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 just kept ticking and that was their line it's so light it doesn't stop it, w- it won't even stop the ticking of of the watch i could that that I mean it wasn't as clunky as that but it was a great image actually so it was a very <laughs> the idea was was brilliant. It didn't make flora margarine taste any better, um, and it certainly didn't make me want to rush out and grab grab my mother and say, "Listen, we get get us some of that uh, flora margarine, please." Uh, no interest whatsoever. But that image of the opened up watch, I thought was very evocative, very powerful, and that's what I'm thinking of now. Come back to this idea of. If we're the creations, let's just imagine for the sake of my my little argument. And there's more to this. If we are just the creations of a toy maker. So you imagine us as, imagine yourself as a faceless being prior to your identity emerging. And you're just a little toy a little machine and your back is opened and all those cogs i mean i'm regretting now not looking up the the vocabulary to describe all the individual parts of a watch or a clock um and in fact i know a guy there's a guy who lives near me and he trained as uh as an as a horologist a clockmaker watchmaker um (laughs) <laughs> his his favorite joke um his favorite joke is to say he thought he was going to be working with prostitutes <laughs> it, yeah anyway but he was a, a horologist you get it i'm sure so imagine 
all those beautiful little cogs and again for me they're always they're always kind of brassy in color or gold in color beautiful little wheels of different sizes interacting with each other this beautiful symbiotic relationship one thing doesn't move without another thing moving and the brilliance of a of a, a, a watch or a clock is these different cogs are moving at different speeds different paces i guess depending on the size of the cog or the size of the teeth on the cog and imagine then your setting this this sort of um this the, the ultimate toy maker making humans and and again i'm not i'm not going to <laughs> i'm not drifting towards a god analogy that's not what this is about at all okay that that's not useful to me uh, in in this argument um or this idea i don't get lens anything so i mean for, you know if you want to imagine geppetto the toy maker from pinocchio you can i don't care if you want to imagine william hurt's character from steven spielberg's uh, dark AI, uh, science fiction movie AI dark because Staniel 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 <laughs> Staniel that's a good name Stanley Kubrick because he started making that movie and then Spielberg took over so there is there's a, a dark a darkness throughout that movie but William Hurt is the the manufacturer um, again William Hurt was great at playing those sort of cerebral these cold cerebral characters um but you imagine the toy maker making you and just like for no reason other than wanting a variety of toys for wanting a variety of of beings that the toy maker sets your cogs running at a higher rate than the next toy that they're about to work on and that's the, the, you know and this this metaphor lends itself to the idea that yeah there's a natural setting for all of us all of us probably have been given a natural tempo that you know the place where we naturally sit um and i know you can start thinking anatomically you know about the heart rate but i mean we can we can slow down our heart rate again through the breath and similarly we can accelerate it through the breath or through uh, a little bit of exercise or whatever but we're staying in my my world the place i look i most like to be the world of, of metaphors and, and images and imaginings um because it helps me understand things better so think about that setting ask yourself what do you think your setting is where do you think your you know the, the machinery of your inner clockwork where do you think that is where is it located in your body and how fast is it running um and in a way if we, if we want to jump from the world of toys to the the world of of animals i suppose it's like I don't know, maybe it's like looking at uh, an elephant or a blue whale um, and comparing them to uh, a hummingbird or a chihuahua. <laughs> it, it, it makes me instantly laugh. Uh, <laughs> those different, different tempos, the different clockworks. Now that's across different animal species and they're very obvious differences in terms of energy levels in terms of size in terms of pace in terms of what they need to consume to to stay alive to do what they have to do their 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 general mode of of behavior their general mode of interaction with life um now luckily for that blue whale and that elephant and that hummingbird and that chihuahua None of them are being forced to consume the world the way we are. Um, if anything, certainly for the, the wild animals, um, the world is in danger of consuming them. Um, that's, a, that's, another, that's another thought. Maybe we feel like we're being consumed by the pace of life. Maybe we feel like we're being consumed 
by the consumables um that's uh that's just to add that's just to add to your anxiety if you're feeling a bit anxious today but so what's my proposition my proposition is and this is where again the suggestibility of the brain the power of the imagination where it can be so beneficial if we're willing to engage that side of ourselves and if we decide yeah i mean i'm anxious all the time i mean i never feel i can fully relax and we do a simple visual exercise like visualing visualing i'm just i'm really loving the um <laughs> the new words the neologisms i'm coming up with today staniel visualed the click quack if we visualize the components of the watch the components of the clockwork this machine that sets our tempo and if we feel in an anxious state or in an if we if we feel that we fall into a default high running overly fast frenetic although hyper regular clockwork setting what can we do to slow that down well very simple you visualize that and you visualize the the speed of those cogs and you can imagine hearing uh, a hyper fast tick 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 that type of ticking which is not going to make anybody relax that is not conducive to chilling out and staying calm what we do is we create that visual in our mind and we simply focus on our breathing with that visual and we take a big breath in and on every out breath we allow those cogs to ever so slightly slow down we take an in breath again and when we breathe out dropping our energy down down into the belly down into the diaphragm down through the trunk down through the hips legs we let those cogs just slow down a little with each out breath little by little by little and then over time instead of being at the the the, the high paced tick 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 we can slow down to tick 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 slow down slow down slow down and trust that that tempo the slower more relaxed tempo is accessible to us is available to us and it's pulling energy back back into ourselves rather than that accelerant that's pulling us away from ourselves that's rolling us down the hill that's running us off the road into the ditch that isn't allowing us to take the space and take the time to relax um and if you want another another movie analogy um unforgiven clint eastwood's western masterwork um <laughs> funnily enough i i i just i just rewatched another one of his uh you know greatly hailed uh directorial efforts I think it's from 76 that was um the outlaw Josie Wales uh where he's the the confederate soldier who well he wasn't a soldier he's a confederate um uh, a southern man who wanted to uh keep the war going after his 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 wife and child had been butchered by rampaging union soldiers um and he joins up with a bunch of renegades who ultimately surrender but he wants to keep fighting um it's actually a beautiful film to look at some really yeah lovely cinematography and a couple of very um iconic framings of clint um when he's just about to unleash hell but um there's one <laughs> there's one bizarre uh it's it's not a motif as such but this um running joke 
in the movie is that he's um he's 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 almost always chewing tobacco and has to spit out that you know gross black spit somewhere and it feels like there's four or five times in the movie where there's a dog who's sort of around or kind of his companion and he kind of looks at the dog with contempt and spits his tobacco tobacco juice on the dog it's um it's bizarre um but anyway that's so, so that, that <laughs> again <laughs> have the animal the animal activists up in arms there's also a very funny performance in that movie by uh, an american indian actor chief dan george um who just has this sort of he's an elderly uh american indian who ends up teaming up with josie wales clint's character and he sort of cuts all the the self-seriousness and po-facedness of clint's earnest determined grim reaper of a cowboy and uh yeah chief dan george he's just a he's just a tonic <laughs> he's very funny um yeah there's some and then there's a there's also a speaking of the american indians there's a meeting that clint has with the uh the fearsome leader of the uh of the comanches and um i suppose it was eastwood's way of showing um you know through his character that he had respect for the legacy of the american indian but there's a very funnily scripted scene like a impromptu peace treaty that clint negotiates so he and his crew of would-be settlers will be left alone by the the comanches um anyway look whatever worth worth looking at um but unforgiven is what i wanted to talk about so unforgiven famously unforgiven you know regarded as a revisionist western i think it was was it 92 maybe um which shows clint as a retired aging bad man who somewhat reluctantly agrees to pick up his guns again um to go and uh settle some uh settle a, a score with these um these bad men who uh cut up some prostitutes in a in a town out in the wild west and uh, he's convinced to do so by a young wannabe gunslinger this uh young young man who has terrible eyesight and uh, can't hit anything but just wants to be a, a badass um and morgan freeman accompanies him his old his old uh, comrade from the bad old days and it was revisionist because i suppose it, it showed the the myth of these gunslingers i exposed the myth that they were they were mortal they were frail it it sort of it didn't um glorify them or deify them um and it pitches eastwood's character up against um real nasty gene hackman uh he's little bill the sheriff of the town where the action goes down um and ultimately gene hackman is so mean and vicious that uh he ends up killing morgan freeman um and then clint has to go back and get revenge and uh you know settle all debts so to speak but his his thing is and this i think he he reveals his philosophy of killing or his strategy for killing more so um to the young man at one point in the movie and basically it's like stay calm take your time raise your gun slowly and take out who you have to take out because if you if you succumb to the fear and the anxiety uh you're gonna make a mistake you're gonna miss you're gonna fail to reload your weapon in time you're gonna drop it on the floor and of course that all comes to pass just as he describes in the the final sequence where um 
he 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 takes out Gene Hackman. That that movie stands up really really well. Some fantastic performances. Um, yeah, Clint is great. Gene Hackman, Morgan Freeman, uh, Richard Harris. Um, yeah, really really excellent. So um, so there you go. If you want to uh, if you want to stay calm, if you if the <laughs> if the the mechanics of the clock don't help you. Maybe maybe think of Clint Eastwood in Unforgiven as the the bitter old pro who still knows what he what has to be done when it has to be done. Stay calm, raise that arm slowly, take aim, and away you go. Um yeah, so there you go. Um so another thing in the mix this week um and i'll probably uh i'll probably wrap up with this mikhail gorbachev just died a couple of days ago and um gorbachev of course was the the last leader of the soviet union before the the wall came down before the walls came down the berlin wall specifically and then the walls uh the metaphorical walls of the many of the states that comprised the soviet union um and gorbachev was at the forefront of creating the pathway for that uh between he and ronald reagan just finally taking the the heat out of the the last bit of heat out of the cold war and de-escalating their nuclear weapon systems uh, and Gorbachev ushered in the era of glasnost, which is openness, and perestroika, which is restructuring or reconstruction. Um, he he felt that that was that was the way forward. Um, now, if you read some of the analysis and some of the obituaries and some of the responses to his death. The general thrust seems to be he was greatly was and continues to be celebrated in the liberal West, but that he is much loathed and detested in what remains of uh, well in, in Russia fundamentally um, because of the the end of communism um, brought huge huge economic crisis to Russia um, and. Putin certainly refers to the the end of the Soviet Union as um, you know the greatest geopolitical catastrophe of of the century. Now I don't know if he means of the twenty first century or just of the or of the last hundred years, but he uh, he couldn't be more um, different in his view of what was best for Russia and the Soviet Union than Gorbachev. Now there are, there are liberal voices in Russia who have lamented the passing of Gorbachev and said we've all we've all lost a father. Um, certainly, my view was that he was a, a force for good. Um, but what the hell do I know? Uh, I'm always about I'm always about making peace. Um, and if if you don't want if you if you if you're interested in the cold war and if you're interested in the dissolution of the soviet union and you're looking for a way to revisit that without looking at something too dry too too political or too um historical i couldn't recommend more the brilliant uh documentary red Army. Now I've mentioned this before um, on an earlier episode of the podcast, but Red Army is a documentary from 2014 by an American director, Gabe Polsky, and the focus of that documentary is a leading, the leading player of one of the greatest ice hockey teams Russia ever produced, and it had its heyday in the in the probably in the late 70s early 80s and um it's just superb as political commentary it's superb as a 
sports as a sports movie as a kind of a sports hero trajectory um but it's such a well-made documentary and so intelligent and places ice hockey into the the crosshairs of the cold war and what it represented in that 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 culture war between russian communism and american capitalism russian repression american freedom um and what a super talented but very uh, patriotic russian ice hockey player what he had to do to to make the most of his career um, and how it brought him into conflict with the russian authorities uh, and how in spite of everything he never lost his his love of his country his culture um, and how how he how he sort of returned to try and play a role in where russia is now really really fascinating and, and very funny in fact but also very poignant um and really uh yeah really fascinating um really fascinating and incisive and evocative in its depiction of a sport that you might not know much about it's not, i'm not it's not like i'm a big ice hockey fan in fact all the ice hockey i've ever watched um has been in that that documentary and i think um the movie miracle which um depicts the american ice hockey team defeating the supposedly invincible russian hockey team at the the winter olympics in whatever it was 1980 foof, 1980 i can't remember what date kurt russell is in that that's quite an enjoyable little sports movie too so um oh, there's probably one before from the 80s as well with rob lowe was that young blood was it am i wrong <laughs> i don't bloody know maybe patrick swayze's in that as well uh ah, slap shot there's another there you go there's four in fact mystery alaska there's five so there you go ice hockey movies i've got ice hockey movies coming out my ears but those other ones are fiction uh well the, the miracle based on a true story um red army is the absolute winner oh my goodness you can i think you can watch that on youtube for like three euros so um seek that one out red army directed by gabe polsky p-o-l-s-k-y um absolutely brilliant um really really good um to 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 force a wellness metaphor onto um onto <laughs> onto gorbachev's passing and the end of the soviet union the idea of of the disparate parts of ourselves war warring with each other of parts of ourselves wanting to break away um uh and then the of course the 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 great the great metaphor of 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 a wall coming down um i think i think there's something in that isn't there in terms of our internal strife our internal conflicts um and again the the, the setting of the watch the the wall of course a wall can be something that on a positive side a wall is something that holds us up that keeps things up that keeps a keeps a room together that keeps a house up um but a wall of course can be an image or a metaphor of division as it was in berlin um and when that came down in 1989 that was a, a monumental um political cultural historic moment um but i wonder is that something we need to think about as well as as a source of anxiety what are we what's blocked off in us what walls need to come down internally um and you think of the flow of of, of clockwork all the cogs working imagine throwing a wall into that imagine throwing a wall into the into the clockwork a little brick wall going up all the cogs stop running the way they should 
everything gets thrown out and the, the hands of the watch stop moving so then you don't have time at all I don't know if that I mean gosh you know like where, where does that one go do we get into a zen state of mind there is no time there is just now um, I don't know I think we we're looking for flow we're definitely looking for the flow of breath the flow of energy so then the openness of glasnost is desirable the restructuring of perestroika restructuring takes work and restructuring is confronting but if you're not in a well place it's kind of necessary isn't it so um yeah don't be afraid to go there and uh yeah, Mikhail Gorbachev, best of luck, best of luck to him. I hope his um, his legacy um, survives. Um, I think he was a he was a he was a force for good and a force for geopolitical good. And I don't believe Putin is. So there you go. Last word there on Putin. It's time to finish up. I uh, I hope you've enjoyed this. Thanks for listening. I hope your your clock is ticking okay. Um. You can get me on social media. The Clear Out Podcast is on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. The Clear Out 2 is on Twitter. And you can email me anytime you want at theclearoutlive at gmail.com. If you like what you hear, if you feel you want to contribute to this independent podcast, you can do so. There should be a supporter link in the description where you're listening to this. And you can throw any contribution you like there or if you want to become a regular contributor a patron of the show patronizing the arts you can do so using the patreon link that's www.patreon.com forward slash the clear out i'd welcome anything you can give uh, just to support this endeavor and to help me keep it going and keep faith in this thing it's the clear out it's wellness with attitude. It's brought to you with love and good vibes and positivity. And I hope, I hope that's coming through. Okay, I've got to go and teach some Tai Chi. I will see you next week. More from the tell, more from this thing that I do, explorations of wellness. Okay, all the best. Mind yourselves. Talk to you real soon. Take care. Bye. Bye.